I first talked to Harold Parker back in the 1980s when he was looking for bobcat dogs from the West Coast. And now it seems like every few months I am visiting him at his house, bringing dogs or picking up dogs. And um, I had to make a puppy delivery. And so I asked him if we could maybe talk and I could record him and share it with you all. And he agreed to that. And I'm very thankful for that. And I, I think it's going to be interesting for you. It sure was for me. So through Louisiana over the river and through the woods and let's get into this let's just work our way where we're going you can kind of see there's a gap where that big pine tree is. I can drive right there. across here? Yeah, you, oh, okay. but you, you might. But I think just loop around. There's an old road goes okay. just right side that thing. Don't get too close to the fence. I mean, I think it's dry enough. But this is a wet natured old place. I hate to walk back to the house I mean, to get a stop right here if you want. I mean, well, that's over there. Is, I think. Nice place. They tra track folks are going to be driving by here. Head right for it now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. About 20 hogs out there in a couple of hours. Is that right? Yeah. I don't want to mess with them. my brother, and he's got two boys. They, every time they come out, they shoot them. I saw them yesterday afternoon. Are they, feed, are they feeding them over there? Or? No, no, they just eat. They out come out. Yeah, oh, it's right, out. right? Yeah, I thought of it. Just, uh, it just depends on how much you feel like talking, but uh, I thought it'd be great just to get your story. I mean, you. You know so much about tree and walkers. You know so much about cow dogs. And you know so much about, I mean, your whole journey of getting to where you finally started catching cats the way you wanted to. And, uh, the kind of dogs that you ended up being satisfied with. I mean, that's a long, that's a long road getting there. And I know, I know you bought dogs from the east coast you bought them from the west coast yeah, you bought them from the south you anywhere you anywhere you cut her from straight north is the only place i've never bought a dog but i mean i bought dogs out there when you lived out there in washington you know i bought that dog from you and i bought one from Alabama. tom barnes oh, tom barnes mm -hmm. yeah let's go left. Okay. that's what i mean yeah, that's why i say you you might know more about Really, as far as the diversity of dogs that have been used for bobcat successfully in different regions. Well, I wouldn't, I, I should, you know, I'm probably a dumbass if I don't because, uh, yeah, there, I, I don't know of anybody that has bought dogs from every, every, part, of the every country, part of the country, yeah. really. I hadn't bought dogs from the northeast or straight north because, it, you know, I mean, it's just really, there's a few, but most all the cat dogs, that part of the world are snow, just snow dogs. Snow dogs, yeah. yeah. Wouldn't have any value to me anyway. Yeah. You know, I was thinking after you mentioned that, I got your book and I read it right after it came. Okay. Out, but I don't. Uh, I guess when I moved over here, I don't know. We're gonna turn left, right? You got to swing out because the deal kind of goes. Or you go, oh, go through those okay. two gates there. My brother's got a campfire. Oh. I look. If it's in there on the river. That'd be a great place to do it. But I don't know whether there's a gate. Sometimes there's a key there at the gate, and sometimes there's not. I mean, this will be a good place. I thought. Okay. You know a lot about tree and walkers, for one thing. You've had some good ones, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, is it the Schooner River dogs? Schooner or? River and basically house-bred dogs before that, before there was a Schooner River Lipper. He was that old house's Lipper, and I mean, I I hunted some uh, houses, Tom Tom, dog, you know, dogs straight off old Tom Tom or some of the first registered dogs I ever had. The first uh, coon dog I ever had was a 
a high tan, tan colored dog that a local game warden who was a good friend, his son was a real good friend of mine. And uh, I guess when I was 14, he had a litter of puppies and I saved up money and gave him $10 for one of the puppies. Oh, $10, that was your first coon out. Yeah, and uh, she made a really good dog. I hunted squirrels with her that fall just when she was four or five months old. Now, how old were you then? I was 14. Okay. The first time I ever went coon hunting, I was eight years old. My daddy didn't hunt anything. But he was obvious I loved the outdoors, and he carried me with two local coon hunters. One of them was a pretty good kind of coon hunter, and the other one had a bloodhound. He worked at the prison and uh, thought one of the bloodhounds would make a good dog. So needless to say, we didn't have a great hunt, but I was fascinated and pretty much hooked at eight years old my first trip to the woods at night really and sent after that like i say i had a friend who was a uh was a local game warden and a coon hunter and a really good dog man and um of course back then we didn't have shocking collars and tracking collars and he had broke dogs but he was rough on them i mean <laughs> He yeah. was rough. He was yeah. a good guy, I thought, but yeah. he's good to me, I'll put it like that. But, uh, yeah, th that first female, she made a really nice hound. Got out of a corn crib when she was three years old. I put it in there because she was in heat and got out of the corn crib and got run over. And hmm. I think, you know, by then I was 16 and I cried all day at that. I mean, hmm. I loved that dog. But I just progressed from there. I had other coon dogs, mostly mixed breed dogs out of a local strain similar to that dog. Okay. And back then, I mean, dogs, they were tree dogs. But when they treed, they had coons. You, <laughs> you cut the tree down or you, uh, so somebody along that climbed the tree. I never was good at it, but, but I had friends that they'd climb the top of the tallest poplar in the woods, barefooted. They just take their shoes <laughs> off and go up it like a monkey and the coon was up there. And when you when you do that, you, you got dogs that tree coons. So mm. there you know, there wasn't any question about whether the coon was there. We squalled a lot of coons out and re ran them. Nobody ever carried so, it gone? So uh, very seldom. Mm. I mean I you know, occasionally, but that was not the norm. We re running those coons, jumping them out and having a race of course, now that's frowned on terribly, and it keeps you from having tree dogs, but I think it had a whole lot to do with the fact that when the dogs tree, they had a coon, you know. Yeah. They were trying to catch, they wanted to catch him. Yeah. They didn't just want a tree. Yeah. And they bred a lot of these dogs, just a little too much tree into them. Uh, and just for stay on the strain of the, the walker dogs, I coon hunted primarily uh Till I never was really could be serious about cat hunting till I was uh, 35 probably. Mm -hmm. But I coon hunted all that time, kept a squirrel dog, had beagles on and off. I loved to hear rabbit race. Uh, but I had got the cat hunting fever. There was a, a man that was basically my age now that lived up Bowie River, Five, 10 miles from where I was raised there at Sumrall, and he had a pack of beagles. And he really was not a hunter to start with, but he had a heart problem, and he lived in a great place on the river where it, well, we call it the Forks of Bowie and Terrible, where Terrible Creek ran into Bowie River. And that was, I mean, back then it was almost the equivalent of, of, of a wilderness area, just a big area, nobody lived. And uh, the woods were a lot more open then. But at any rate, he had a bean a field that uh, his nephew planted soybeans in every summer. And he got to hunting around the edge of those fields, running his beagles after rabbits. And one morning they got after a cat that had come down that swamp. And he shot the cat and wounded it. And the beagles ran it another 15 or 20 minutes and baited up. And they just literally went cat crazy. <laughs> well, I, my grandmother, I was 
12 years, maybe I was 14 years old then. It was when I just started coon hunting. My grandmother lived in Collins and taught school with this guy's wife, and he, she told him that Mustestas had caught a big bobcat that morning and had it hanging on a pole out in front of his house. So my grandmother drove me 15 miles down there to look at that cat <laughs> hanging on the pole while I was running. Well, <laughs> the next year, I got driver's license, paid $100 for an old beat-up, banged-up car, and uh, I, the first thing I did after I got my driver's license was drove up there to uh, Mr. Altman's in that old car and talked to him. And he, as you would probably imagine, he... He was kind of fascinated that a kid was that interested because nobody was much mm -hmm. interested. Nobody cat hunted. I mean, that was unheard of back then. And, and there weren't as many cats. There wasn't as much cut over. Uh -huh. But anyway, if those uh, beagles got after a cat, they would pretty much run him down and bay him. But it was relatively open woods. A briar patch then was four acres. Okay. And the rest of it was kind of open country. I, I guess timber, timber just wasn't worth anything, and they didn't. Uh, people didn't sell it. When we were coon hunting, you carried a. Depending on who you were hunting with, you, you carried a. The more affluent coon hunters carried a chainsaw. Uh, the less affluent ones carried a crosscut saw or an axe, and you if you couldn't if you couldn't squall him out. Or climb a tree and jump him out, you cut the tree down. <laughs> and I never, I've never heard anybody saying or anybody even worried about it. You yeah. know, now they'd put you in jail. It'd be a felony to cut down <laughs> all the big pine trees. But having said that, uh, that was my first taste. I hunted with Mr. Estes several times. Never got after a kit. Then one morning, caught a kit uh, or, or baited a kit up on Bowie River. They ran him all, nearly all day, and baited him up on the river bank across the river. It was in February and the river was up and I took his truck. He stayed there and watched the dogs and I took his truck and drove 10 miles around and came in by somebody's house and came in there and killed a cat with a 22 pistol. His, those beagles couldn't kill a cat, okay. but they would bait him. They wouldn't let him go anywhere. But those were the damnedest cat races I've ever heard. I mean, they just cried when they got him running down. I mean, it, it was good. They were, big, they were big type beagles and they were good dogs. And, uh, well, he's still rabbit hunting with them. But if they ever smelled a cat, it was over. And we'd go and we'd just walk. You know, you may walk all day. And finally, they'd smell a cat in the afternoon. And sometimes you didn't find a cat. But we caught a lot of cats. Actually, we caught 21 cats one winter. And that was after. He, he, he hunted close to home. But after I got to be 18 or 19, anybody I saw that hunted or said anything about hunting, I asked them about bobcats. And so I wound up finding him places where there were cats to hunt. And on Saturdays, we yeah. about every Saturday we'd cat hunt. So that was my first taste of cat hunting. But I really wasn't in any position to uh, cat hunt per se then, but I coon hunted right on through it. Uh, and I've had a... a I mean, a blessed life and a fortunate life, but it's been pretty up and down. I've either, I'm either doing great or not so good. I've always said that I uh, uh, have been broke more than most people in my life. I've had people ask me, how do you stand to either be doing really good or be broke? And I say, well, whenever I'm broke, I just hunt my way out of it. I just hunt till I can kind of put something else together. And that's why I've hunted more than most people, okay. you know. Yeah. Been broke more than most people, and I just hunt when I'm broke. <laughs> One of those times, later on, after I had first started cat hunting, I really wasn't. I just had just old thrown together junk, but I was trying. I'd gotten hold of an old broke cat dog from an old cat hunter down in South Texas, who's pretty illustrious, and he's famous in some circles and infamous in others, named <laughs> Pooh Butler. And I had this old broke dog, and he was broke, but he was slow. You couldn't catch a cat with him, and I just had whatever kind of walker dog I could get, tree and walkers, mm -hmm. trigs. And I didn't catch any cats much, but I had some cat races and other kind of races too, because this was just a little before shock collars and tracking collars. Somebody asked my daddy, uh, 
one day. He said, I hadn't seen him. Daddy, Daddy always, he tolerated hunting, but he didn't. And he, he tried to help further me with my hunting, but he wasn't a hunter, and he certainly wasn't a hound man. So he didn't quite understand it. Was he a cattle man? No. No. No, no. He, Daddy sold, uh, he, he, uh, Sold groceries for merchants company. Started out on the dock at merchants company, which was a grocery sale company, and uh, worked up to salesman. And then, when I was four years old, got the postmaster job in Summerall. My mama taught school, so he, they were both, you might say, government employees forever. They were great people, just good as could be. Raised a good family, like I, I said, it uh, the. When the preacher was looking at a, a daddy's obituary, he got all of me and my siblings together, which I'm the oldest, and said, you know, what can y'all tell me about your daddy or about your family that I can use? And I said, well, one thing I can tell you is, I said, daddy spent his whole life uh, trying to help other people. Hmm. And he raised a family that had spent their whole life trying to help themselves. And we've been pretty good at it, really. But at any rate, Daddy told the guy, his answer to the guy was, when the guy said, what's Harold doing? I hadn't seen him in a while. Daddy said, well, I'll tell you what he's doing. He said he coon hunts one night, and he cat hunts the next morning. Then he hunts dogs for two days, and then he starts all over again. <laughs> so anyway, that's kind of been been my life. The, these, uh, the beep beep collar sure made it some better and his garments have made it a whole lot better <laughs> but uh i wish it'd come up with something that was a little cheaper this garment deal's got to be awfully expensive especially because they won't stand behind some of their stuff anymore but uh from from that i, I coon hunted basically pleasure pleasure hunted i'd have a hound and they were basically housebred hounds uh, that I thought was worthy of carrying to hunt, and I went. I won a few hunts and had a few kids that were a little more gung ho about competition stuff. Uh, win some pretty big hunts with some dogs that belonged to me, but I just kept on seeing a cat track every now and then, and and I coon hunted a lot in the mornings and. It just, I, I never could get the cat deal out of my mind. So uh, I was getting bigger and bigger in the cattle business and busy. And there was a stretch there that all I had was some beagles and one coon dog. But I never got out. And uh, then I got pretty serious about coon hunting and went to a uh, wimp there in Winston Aaron up in North Mississippi had by then was developing this Schooner River strain of hounds. And I, I'm just, I, I, I want a track dog. I mean, treeing's great. I love to hear a dog tree, but I have no interest in walking out there and looking at, at empty trees. I wasn't raised that way. It just, mm -hmm. just ain't me. And um, it seemed to me like I tried, like everybody, every world champion puppy there was out there. And I hunted some John Wick dogs that I really liked. But uh, I got on the Schooner River dogs, and, and I really liked them. They, they were, were nice, nice hounds. Not every one of them, but the average was better. My rule of thumb was what kind of dog, you, if you, could you take that dog and actually tree a coon after daylight? Because that's the way I grew up hunting. And there was a lot of dogs that would tree a coon at night, but they ain't very many dogs that will consistently tree coons after daylight. They make trees, but after daylight, it ain't hard to tell, you know. And I just felt, felt like the Schooner River dogs uh, were more my kind of dogs. They'd drive a track, they'd catch a, a coon that wanted to run in a beaver pond or a cutover, run him two hours and catch him on the ground. Well, that's my kind of coon hunting. And I always figured if you took one of those kind of dogs to town at night, he'd win his part of the hunts, and they did. I, I just, I'm not a rules kind of person, and, and most of those competition hunts are won with 
rules. Mm -hmm. Now I hear people say that all oh, those dogs that just make trees, they that they won all the competition hunts. That's not true. The dogs that win the big hunts and consistently win basically get off by themselves in tree canes. They're really not what a pleasure hunter would want to hunt. But they tree canes. They got a tree canes to do that. But uh, that uh, w when I married, I I'd been married early on to a high school, the girl I dated in high school. I, uh, we got a divorce. Cal Ben, she's a great person. But she really thought I would have a nine to five job instead of no job and trying to live by my wits in a sale barn or grazing cattle and anyway it d didn't work out but the second time i got married by then i was handling a lot more cattle and i decided i wanted to uh, cat hunt and i stayed oh, in my yeah. wife i was 35 and in my trucking wife uh Dawn was very supportive of my hunting. She was would a lot rather me being hunting, be hunting than doing a lot of other things I might have been doing. So I got to looking in the magazines and whatever, and finally found this guy Poole Butler's number in South Texas had dogs for sale, and I drove down there to South Texas and hunted two or three nights, and we caught three or four cats every night. And I said, "Well, this is what I need," and see, you know, this is deal and I spent money I didn't have I've been bad I've borrowed money to buy more dogs than most people have ever bought <laughs> but uh I brought those South Texas dogs up here that look like a million dollars in South Texas and huh, they look like about ten dollars up here that mm. up here this country's just it's different mm. uh for one thing down there you need a tree dog because most of those cats are going to tree they're going to run 15 to 30 minutes and go up a tree up here you're better off without a tree dog because if you've got a tree dog the kit tends to there's so much undergrowth and down timber and if you got a dog that has any tree mindedness to him he goes to hanging up and every time he does that the kit just gets further and does more has more time to play tricks and he just gets further and further ahead uh, one of the things that every coon hunter that I've ever talked to that's hunted in this part of the country said, oh yeah, I've run a catch, you tree them and they jump out and go again when you get close to the tree. I've had the same exact experience with my coon dogs on several occasions. Running them with these walker dogs, if they go up a tree, which is not very often, they don't want any part of coming down. I've cut trees down to rerun them like running a coon and they go 50 feet and go back up and the only thing i can figure is that those dogs are oh those cats are running up something jumping out and going on when you get close to the tree the dog reaches out there and you know gets to check in or whatever uh either that or two or three coon dogs just that cat's just lolling along not very scared but if you run him like he's supposed to be run he's scared and he ain't coming out of that tree unless you shoot him out or take a pole and punch him out but i just don't tree a lot of kits and i don't keep a tree dog uh because it's, uh, it's, it's just not practical and mm -hmm. you're not gonna catch many cats like that uh not too late into the game of cat hunting like i say i started out those poo butler dogs somebody told me about a doctor Teal, who was a veterinarian at Meridian, and that Dr. Teal caught some cats along. And I called Dr. Teal, and he was nice, and I talked to him. And he said, I certainly don't have any cat dogs to sell. He said, I buy dogs. I don't sell dogs. But said, uh, I have bought some fox dogs in South Georgia that made good cat dogs. And so I picked that up and ran with it, and I called and people I knew kettle people in Florida and Georgia and around and I called till I found some fox hunters and got in touch with a guy named Glenn Mullis who was a very good dog man and I bought 
several dogs off of Glen down through the years. What I wanted to buy was a young dog because at that time I might hunt five nights all night long and never find a cat. I mean, you might find one cat in a week. Mm. It's awful hard to train a dog like that. Mm. But if you get one, hold of one of those South Georgia dogs that had been running Gray Fox with, and they'd run him four or five nights a week. He'd have him deer broke. He might not be coat broke. We didn't have any coats. Well, we did have coats, and they, they got coats after we did. But uh, they had them relatively broke and where they'd handle good and where they knew how to run something. And he also knew which dogs would do you some good and which what and wouldn't. And, you know, I'd give more than a fox hunter would mm -hmm. give to get the better end of the young dogs and that's kind of the way i got started doing that so i got to catching a few cats like that and then i had a sale barn friend were these walkers yeah they were walker dogs walker fox, yeah, hounds. Walker fox hounds i glenn's dogs were basically liquor bred dogs but i had i mean i bought one here there and yon i mean anything anybody had a dog better than mine i mean i never have envied anybody having a good dog i see a lot of people bad mouth people's dogs and all if you got a dog better than i got if i got the money and you'll sell it i'll try to buy it from you if not i'll try to breed to it uh i i, I want a better dog one yeah. time glenn told me i called him i said glenn uh these kits are uh, darn kits are getting away from me too often i said i'm jumping kits but i, I can't stay up under them and he said, oh, you've caught all the easy ones. And I said, yeah, but I need a little help. And there's some help out there. He said, oh, I know you just like everybody else. You just want something to outrun your buddies. <laughs> I said, no, I don't want anything to outrun my buddies. I want something to outrun what I got. I, 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 I don't, I hunt by myself anyway. So that's not, you are wrong. You're not wrong about a lot, but you're wrong about that. I ain't, I, ain't, I just want something that's better than what I got. And that, that has been my impetus all through the years mm -hmm. I, 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 I'm not trying to compete with anybody else I, I, I'm competing with myself mm -hmm. to have better hounds and uh, I'd, I'd been in this thing and like I say the South Georgia dogs I, I, I caught some cats and then I had a sale barn friend of mine call me one night and he knew I was cat hunting and oh uh, he said, I got a man here at the stockyard that you need to talk to. And I said, what, who is that? Joe Mac. Joe Mac Smith was a guy that called me, and he was a big-time fox hunter. He fed, he got the uh, dog food from, uh, he fed his dogs from the Chinese restaurant in Poplarville. <laughs> he fed 50 or 60 hounds all the time. They looked better than anybody's. <laughs> but uh, he said, Finney Clay from Florida, or Finney Clay is from Brenham, Texas, and he's here at the sale barn. He used to have land down here when we were kids, and he's a cat hunter. And he's coming back from Florida, going to Texas, and he's down here. And I told him about you, and you need to talk to him. So I talked to him. What year was that? Oh, uh, no. I would say that that was, uh, let's see, 35, you know, 86, mm -hmm. 7, somewhere in there. Yeah. And, uh, because <clears throat> I'm thinking I talked to you about 85. It was. And, you know, and it about may have been 85 that, that yeah. I talked to Finn. You know, I think maybe Finney had come through and I had hunted with him and then he invited me to go, uh, to uh, Florida where he lived uh, most of the time. And I l fell in love with that hunting down there. And Finney taught me a lot about hounds and hunting. He uh, knew as much, if not more than anybody about cat hunting and about uh, breeding walker dogs. First thing Finney told me, uh, you know, he knew I was having a little trouble catching kits i had trail dogs and strike dogs by then but i had a hard time putting pressure on them and uh he said well he said what you need to do is find you three or four julys to put in your pack until you can get some good walker dogs and he said those julys <laughs> will help you catch stuff 
And I, I basically kind of did that. And, and I, I liked my Julys. I, I wouldn't, other than the fact that I've bred these dogs as long as I have at this point, I mean, it wouldn't hurt my feelings to have a good July today. But I'm not going to go look for one because I'm getting along pretty good like it you, is. You think they run the catch more than, than yeah, the walkers? Yeah, that, that was Finney's theory, and okay. I assume that that's right. Okay. I mean, you know, they they swing and cut and dive okay. more than the walkers. Right. It's what Finney said. And okay. I, I don't know how much experience he had with them. But Finney, he, he was a really good dog, man. He was... He's a tough old guy, and he was uh, awfully opinionated, and some of his opinions were wrong, but <laughs> he was right more than he was wrong. I mean, like, where a dog came, he was yeah. he was certainly my mentor in a lot of ways, and I uh, was the recipient of a puppy alone from Feeney. Feeney didn't buy dogs, and he didn't sell dogs, and he was pretty stingy with who he'd let have one, but he did let me have some. And I'd like to think that I took his foundation and made some outcrosses here and there that have made it more pleasurable. I don't know that these dogs that I've got will catch any more cats than what Finney had. And, and Finney had Mark S. bred. He, he believed through and through on Mark S. bred dogs. And he's line bred those Mark S. dogs all these years, 60 years, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've kind of stuck with that, but I've made some outcrosses that I think added nose and mouth. And, and I like them better than his dogs. His dogs were a little, his early on dogs were a little tight mouth. Now, you know, in his later years, you couldn't differentiate his from mine. We swapped puppies mm -hmm. and did whatever, and uh, that's uh, the thing. Can we stop this? Yep, just a second? Yep, absolutely. I mean, yeah, this boys. I talked to Finney Clay's son, Carrie, and Carrie said that the red color that shows up in a lot of the later dogs came from the rusty dog that Harold found in South Georgia. At, at any rate, that 30, basically 30 years ago, I met Feeney. And that, the South Georgia dogs certainly up my uh, level of success. And the, the clay dogs, which are basically Mark S dogs that Feeney's line bred for all these years, uh, certainly kicked my level of success up some more and i have uh like i say made some outcrosses but not not huge outcrosses i've stayed pretty close and just used some different strains of dogs even some mark s dogs that were outside of this normal line and uh i'm firmly convinced i don't know that i have the best hounds that i've ever had today but I have the best young hounds that I've ever had at this and, age. At this age. Mm -hmm. And so that uh, tells me that maybe, I mean, I really thought we were kind of at a plateau for uh, several years. The dogs were good. They were really good. But they weren't quite as good as I wanted them to be or thought they needed to be. And I, I But I think that this last time, you <laughs> hate to say it, due to an accidental breeding mm -hmm. or two, it's really kicked things up a notch. So mm -hmm. it's it's uh, it's not an Is exact... Is that to the Virginia, those Virginia dogs? Well, actually, yeah, and that wasn't accidental. I mean, that's something that the Virginia dogs, I think, that kicked it up a little bit. But I've got a uh, pair of male dogs... I got one of those dogs that's out old Corky and the Virginia dogs that's really, really nice. He is a super nice. I thought he was going to be the best young dog I've ever had. <coughs> they were born, they'll be, they were two years old in October. Is that Clint or? Well, uh, Clint, well, Clint? The, the, the two, yeah, the two other dogs were Cleet and, and uh, Clyde. Oh, yeah. 
and Clyde's not good as Cleek, but Clyde's, he's a really nice dog. He swings bigger than the other two, which let, you know, they don't, they can't show out quite as much when they're like that, but he helps you, he helps you a whole lot. But old Cleek is, is out of, uh, he, he accidentally, I didn't intend to breed his mother, and she's a... a uh, Betsy Ross? It's Betsy Ross, oh. yeah, yeah. And, of course, she was that old wild man, and Finney didn't want to break me to breed wild man because he was, hey, his mama was a liquor bread dog that I got from Glenn Mullis, and he was a little sloppy looking and had almost shaggy. I mean, he wasn't a terrible looking dog, but anyway, Finney didn't like it. He just thought that was a terrible outcross. Well, the, to be honest with you, the, the cross was not great. There were four of those females, and every one of them made a dog good enough to haul but none of them were outstanding. Mm -hmm. But then I fooled around and let her thought she thought she was out of heat or thought she didn't know she'd come in. Something went hunting one morning when I got back, turned them out in the dog pen. I was taking collars off some more dogs and she and uh, Casper tied up. And I, I think, like I say, the, the uh, Corky Virginia dog cross Really caught my eye early, but that Cleet dog, he's the best dog I've owned since old, uh, the Rip dog that was my greatest contribution to this mm -hmm. Clay Parker cross or whatever. And I'm was that a liquor bread dog? No, he no. was, a, he was actually, his daddy was a dog, I bred a, uh, Mark S. bred dog that I bought from a guy named Red Spark, Glenn, Glenn Mullis, got the dog for me. Uh, Feeney had actually told me, he said, there's a Mark S. dog up there in South Georgia that they say is a really nice dog. And it is a fox dog, but they catch some cats with him too. And he said, they tell me he was the guy I'll sell him. Anyway, I, so I did a little research, and I got the guy's number, and I called him, and the guy wanted $3,500 for him. Fox dog. I said, no, nah, I mean, I, that's <laughs> all well and good, but I'm not going to do that. And uh, so I forgot it. I say forgot it. I didn't pursue it, certainly. Mm -hmm. Probably six months later, Glenn Mullis called me, and I mean, somewhere in the deal, that's, I think, Red Smart at Waycross, and Glenn was over at Scrivens over close to the coast, but they, you know, fox hunters know, and I probably told Glenn that I was interested in the dog with just too much money. Glenn called me, and he said, do you still want that rusty dog? And I said, uh, yeah, I said, yeah, I'd uh, like to have him, but I ain't giving $3,500 for a damn fox dog. And uh, he said, well, he won't cost you that much. And I said, what will he cost? He said, would you give half that? And I said, yeah, I might give that half that if he's as good as they say he is. But I said, what's the matter? Something happened to him or whatever? And he said, no. He said, Red's done got scared of him. And I said, scared of a walker dog? <laughs> and he said, well, he said, he'll just bite you around. The, you know, he's just he's out you around the the dog box mm. and he's just said he made him mad and he said he's he'll sell him for that so anyway i bought rusty brought him home caught four or five cats rusty stood there by my feet the whole time never did run any of them i just kept him on i said i have 1750 dollar fox dog and i don't fox hunt <laughs> and one morning i was running a cat and he got with them and he never missed a beat since then but Rusty was not my type. He was a trailing type of dog. He was extremely cold nosed, great strike dog, but he he just was too much trailing dog. I kept him for three or four years and wound up selling him to Marvin Anderson, I think, over in Louisiana for basically what I uh, gave for him. Might have even made a few dollars, which is unusual for me in a dog trade. And Marvin loved him, kept him till he died. He was perfectly, exactly what he wanted. He loved a trailing dog, and if, he, if they followed him around all day, that was fine. He wanted to hear a race. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but in the meantime, I bred him to a picket bred jeep that I had bought over there in South Georgia. 
uh, from a guy named Scroggins, and she was, she had an outstanding mouth, and I think the good mouths on most of these dogs go back to that hmm. picket bridge. If old Rusty had a big old chopped mouth, but it wasn't anything. But she had a screaming horn kind of mouth that was just really <laughs> make the hair stand up on the back of your head. <laughs> and I, I, she was a, she was a nice young dog. She was a good looking sucker, and I, I liked her. But she was, she, but she swung. She'd swing big. And uh, so I liked that because that helped me stay up on the cat some. But she certainly wasn't a wasn't a finished dog. And one morning I was road hunting in some dry and some tall grass, and I she lay down to scratch fleas or did something, and I ran over and broke her leg. Mm. And uh, I carried her two local vets here, and they worked hard on her, put pins in her leg. And they got her well, but she always carried that big. Hmm. And it, it she never did. She just never was the same dog. But she's still a good dog. But yeah. she wasn't the dog she was. And uh, j just an aside about her was, she's the only dog I've ever seen. Occasionally, you'd tree a cat. And uh, old Kate, where she learned it, I don't know. I mean, she just figured it out, I guess. All other dogs would come in. I'd blow them out. She wouldn't come out. She'd lay there. I, I've had her do it five or six times. And she'd just wait somewhere there until that cat came out. She'd fall back on him. I had a cat on a farm that I owned that I grazed cattle on. And that cat would come in there every now and then. It was a big tom cat. And I'd see his track. And I'd put on him. And they'd trail off in a... Not all that big a block of woods or rough a block of woods, and they just couldn't ever trail it any further. That went on for two or three years, and I couldn't figure what was happening. It just fizzled, you know. And so, uh, one morning they trailed off in there. It was cold in the winter time, and oh, uh, all of them they just fizzled, came out, and. Uh, Old Cripple Kate didn't come out. Well, I had a dog in the truck, and I blew and hollered and cussed. And first thing you know, I don't know where it was, 30 minutes or an hour, that cat, that cat had been going in there and climbing up my tree and laying up. They don't do that very often, but apparently this one did. He came out. Old Kate fell on top of him. I turned the dogs to him. We ran an hour and 10 minutes and caught a big tom kid i never saw his he, he never came back in that country so anyway she taught me a few things but i bred her to rusty that got me a dog i named rip rip was a, a nice dog he cold trailed he would swing big but i think maybe he just wasn't really as smart as he really needed to be because he'd trail a cat he might trail a cat a mile and a half and then it, it would fizzle. And I think he he would swing past them. I mean, he had a tremendous nose, a tremendous mouth. He's a really nice hound. But he didn't jump as much game as he should have for the ability he had. I just trailed a lot of tracks that just we never got jumped. Hmm. But I bred him to, he was still best dog I had. I bred him to a, little bitch that uh, Finney gave me as a puppy named Tammy. And I think that Tammy was litter mate to Reba. There was Tammy and Reba, and oh. I can't remember. Anyway, Tammy was a super nice dog. She she was, she never, the, the, she disappeared. Somebody stole her, and that's another story for another time. But, uh, a matter of fact, I, I, I thought so much of her that I rented a Plane. Somebody told me that if you got a, uh, if you get up in the air with that tracking call, you, your tracking system, you mm -hmm. can find. And I rented a plane, and I went all over South Mississippi for an entire mm. day looking for a signal. Never got one. But uh, be that as it may, I bred the rip dog. It was out of Rusty and Cripple Kate, who was the uh, picket bred dog, to Tammy. And that's where 
what I call the Rip Jr. on his papers, but that's the Rip dog that uh, changed the makeup of, of the clay dogs and my they, dogs. They call too. that the Rip line now, right? Yeah, okay. They, yeah. well, that... well, now, Feeney, after that, had a dog he named Rip. Oh. There was a white dog, oh, okay. and and that's Casper's mama and them. So no, this would have been before finished oh, that, that okay. Rip dog. They, he named his dog Rip after Rip died, okay. and and that Rip dog was not. He didn't have any. Oh, okay. wasn't bred like his dogs at all. Oh, uh, but but at any rate, uh, I bred. Uh, uh, the Rip dog was he was a single best. As Finney like to say, game producing dog that I've ever had. Let I me mean, oh, check his boy. Harold's friend had an accident the night before, and you can see moments in the video where his mind is definitely on his friend. And so I'm just thankful that he was able to give us so much time. We actually spoke for about two hours, I think. My phone ran out of memory at this point. I have some other devices with other things on it from this talk that I hope I can figure out a way to get them to you. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know if you want to hear those other parts, and uh, we'll see you next time.